Hello everyone and welcome to track three. My name is Nakia Simpson and I work as a software engineer and a graduate student. I'm also an organizer for the Google Developers Group in Little Rock, Arkansas and a Women Tech Makers Ambassador. It's my pleasure to introduce our next workshop, Invest in Your Career, Get Google Certified with Margaret Barron, Certification and Credentials Lead at Google, and Alyssa Groves, a Program Lead for the Google Cloud Certification Readiness Program at Google. I'm very excited to share this incredible workshop with you today, so let's get started. Thanks for having us. I'm just going to start off by introducing myself and my colleague here. So I'm Alyssa. Um, I'm a program lead for Google Cloud Certification Readiness in the Americas. So basically what that means is I work with folks to help them get ready to get certified like yourselves. Uh, so really excited to do this. Uh, and I'm going to pass it to Margo to introduce herself as well. Hi, I'm Margo. Nice to meet you all. Um, I am the Certification and Credentials Lead here. Um, and that basically means that anything that has to do with certifications or credentials, we touch. Um, and fun fact about myself at Google, um, I have been at Google for a little over seven years, um, and I have been over, uh, to over 30 cafes around the world, um, some of the best food I've ever had, and some of the most fun locations. Um, Alyssa, what's your fun fact? Ooh, let's see. I've actually been to Google Paris before. I was traveling, and that's one of the really cool things about working at Google is you can go to any office. Uh, the food was really good. So I plus one met really great food across the world. Um, but as we go forward, um, we want to talk on a couple of topics. So one, we're going to talk through the demand for cloud computing roles and what that looks like in this market. The next, we're going to go through some learning resources and the Google Cloud certifications themselves. Then we'll also show you a sample learning journey for the Associate Cloud Engineer track. And then finally, we're going to talk about why these certifications are how they are and how they pay off. So first, as I said, what's the demand like for cloud computing roles? Well, right now, cloud skills are critical and in high demand. There are many leaders that are looking for folks who are competent in the cloud, but we also see that there's a large skills gap in that. And so with that, a lot of employers are posting roles that are asking for cloud skills. We actually saw job postings with these skills listed grow about 40.5% um, from 2019 and 2021. So it's really on the uptick. And what better way to show that you're competent in the cloud than getting certified? And fun fact is that our two certifications or two of our certifications, the professional cloud architect and the professional data engineer are the top two paying IT certifications for 2022 in the US. So definitely a great time to be certified in this market. Now I'm gonna pass it to Margo to talk about our resources. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, so Google Cloud has a lot to offer in terms of learning and what like best fits your learning styles. So four of the different types of channels that we have um, are instructor led. Uh, these are where authorized training partners will actually deliver the class either in person or virtually. And you get that one to one interaction. 
we have on-demand learning. And so this is take it anywhere in the world at any time you'd like. Um, we have a library of over uh, hundreds of courses that you can watch um, at any speed um, towards your goals. Uh, we have hands-on labs. Uh, this is a particular um, like favorite uh, part of mine because you actually get hands-on experience with the Google Cloud platform. Um, and we have labs and quests where you gain experience and then you can get badging along the way. And then, of course, what we're here to talk about today, we have our credentials and certifications. Um, to what Alyssa spoke to, we're seeing this huge need in the market uh, to have skills within specific job roles. And what better way to show employers, schools, and put on your resume and social media that you have those skills by getting Google Cloud credentialed. So going back to the hands-on labs, I wanted to touch on a newer product of ours, Google Cloud Skill Badges. This launched a little over a year ago. Um, and what is a skill badge you might be asking? So these are exclusive digital Google Cloud badges that are verified um, and given to you by Google Cloud. And basically they help and show dem uh, that you can demonstrate specific skill sets. Uh, these are uh, a type of a micro credential. And what we find is really good with something like this is for individuals who want to go deep in a certain area, but in a quick amount of time, uh, people that want to stack different opportunities. Um, this is good uh, preparation for certification, um, as well as just demonstrating different uh, niche uh, areas that you might be interested in. And so what is a skill badge more specifically? It's a bundle of hands-on labs within our Skills Boost platform. Uh, it ranges between five to seven. And the component of it is learning labs where you actually learn how to do something step-by-step. -step. And then the last lab of the quest um, actually gives you uh, a scenario where you have to solve it on your own. And so by taking the final assessment, um, we test your ability and then you're awarded a badge. And so the really cool thing about this is that you can display your badges on your social profile, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, and then you can see all of your badges uh, within your Skills Boost profile. If you wanna learn more, the link is right on the slide. I'm not sure which way it's going to be showing, but just cloud.google.com slash training slash badges. And so back to our certifications, um, they are specifically proficiency and role-based certifications. And what this means for you is that they benchmark you against a specific job role to ensure that you are ready to have success in that role. Um, and the way that we develop our certifications is that we take a wide net of what the um, ecosystem of cloud job roles looks like. Um, and we kind of benchmark our portfolio to match what's in high demand from our customers, partners, um, and what we're seeing in the world. And so when we go and find a job role that we think is relevant or new to uh, the ecosystem, we sit down with a wide range of individuals who have this job role in order to ensure uh, that we are building a certification that actually tests the skills that you have in the day-to-day. -day. Um, and then people who are certified um, are uh, can be confident that the material is up to date because our teams uh, basically evaluate the content on a biannual basis, so twice a year, uh, to ensure that what we're testing against is actually still the same skills um, because the cloud ecosystem is so rapidly changing, we ensure that our certification content matches uh, what we're seeing in the market. So to that extent, here is our portfolio of certifications. So you'll notice that we have three level of certifications. We have our foundational, associate, and professional. Um, foundational is the newest leveling um, and type of certification that we offer. Uh, I'll be going into more details about that the next slide. 
And then our two technical level of certifications are associate and professional. But we have one associate level certification. We typically recommend around six months of hands-on experience with GCP for this. Um, and that's for the associate cloud engineer. And then you'll notice that we have, let me add the math, eight professional level certifications. Um, and what we do typically recommend for a professional level is three plus years of industry experience and then one year's uh, hands-on experience with GCP. Again, this is just recommendations from our side. We have had individuals who have been in the market far longer. Um, we've also had students who teach themselves within a two month time period. So again, within the parameters, these are very general recommendations from our side. Um, and so what we do recommend is if you feel like you want to take a specific certification, that you go to our website, look at the exam guide for each of the certifications and really use the study guide as a benchmark of the knowledge topics that you may or may not know. So let's dive deeper into our newest level of certification, uh, Cloud Digital Leader. So what is a Cloud Digital Leader? Um, we basically made this certification uh, to help distinguish and evaluate the various capabilities of Google Cloud. Um, and so a digital cloud leader is well versed in a basic cloud concepts and can demonstrate a broad application of these cloud computing knowledge. It's job role independent. And so what we mean by this is you'll notice that our other certifications are very rooted in a specific job role, like a cloud engineer, machine learning engineer, and so forth. Uh, but a cloud digital leader is really um, open and broad to allow all levels and types of roles to be able to take this certification. And it really assesses your knowledge of um, understanding the purposes and applications of Google Cloud products. Um, and so if you're wondering, is this right for me? Um, we typically say that it's for tech adjacent roles or individuals who are brand new to the cloud. Um, and so Alyssa and myself are uh, cloud digital leaders. We've been through the process um, and it is a really great starting point in your cloud career uh, or your cloud kind of experience and can definitely be used um, as a starting point into any of our other certifications. So, um, if you are a little more in, uh, further along in your cloud path and cloud digital leader uh, is not meant for you, but you're more interested in our technical certifications, um, we have those two types, again, which are the associate and professional level certifications. And so this slide really helps define where you should start. So if you're wondering which certification to get, break it down this way. Uh, if you um, have more hands-on experience, uh, you design and implement solutions with business objectives, um, you should consider pursuing a professional level certification. Um, if you find that you're new to cloud, new to GCP, um, we do recommend that the associate cloud engineer might be the better of the certifications. It's an excellent entry point into Google Cloud Technologies and is definitely a attainable step uh, towards your path to the professional level certifications. And then again, um, in your role, if you are seeking, if you either are doing this or seeking a job that has more of the technical requirements, we then do recommend the Associate Cloud Engineer as it is the most hands-on um, of the certifications within our portfolio. So just a little about of our exams, and this is going to apply for the technical exam, so the Associate and the Professional Levels, so ACE and then all of the Professional Levels. The length of these exams are two hours, um, the exam format will be a uh, combination of multiple choice and multiple, multiple select questions. Again, there are no prerequisites in which you have to complete in order to be able to sit for the exam. 
Um, and then the exam delivery, you can take um, the exams in a testing center or online proctored from any remote location. And then if you have any more questions about any of this, again, not sure which way the link will show up, but cloud.google.com slash certification slash FAQ will have more uh, information and more questions if you have them. So um, we kind of touched on our certification portfolio. Um, we introduced you to skill badges. We touched on our newest level of certifications, the Cloud Digital Leader Foundational Exam. And then we touched on how to distinguish whether you should start with the Associate Cloud Engineer versus the professional level certification. So what we find is that the Associate Cloud Engineer is where um, most of audiences similar to yourselves would find themselves. And so we thought we should go through the recommended um, learning journey for the Associate Cloud Engineer, break down the different course options, and then kind of link that back to where I started, where we have a full curriculum um, of courses available. So the Cloud Fundamentals Core Infrastructure um, is a great course to start with. You can take this um, on demand um, through any of our learning platforms. Um, Skills Boost, which is our latest uh, learning platform, will actually have a learning offer for you at the end of this, so stay tuned for that. Um, and then we will have Architecting with Google Compute Engine and then Getting Started with Google Kubernetes Engine. Uh, so again, courses that will help prime you with the knowledge. And then we're really going to have the practice part of the learning journey where you can take your knowledge and apply it uh, in those environments. And so we have four skill badges along the way that we recommend that map to the Associate Cloud Engineer. The great thing about these skill badges are you're getting the hands-on experience. You're learning how to actually apply your knowledge from the courses in the GCP environment. And then what's even better is that you actually get a cool badge after you finish each quest, so the multiple labs. And then you can share that with your social media profile um, or your skills boost profile. And so at the very end of that, we have a preparing for course, um, and these are have um, going through the courses and lab works. Um, also on the actual exam web pages, we have documentation, sample questions, and additional resources that you can go to at any point in your um, studying. And then outside of our exam pages, uh, we have partnered with Wiley Publication to uh, create three ad additional study guide materials. And so these are the official Google Cloud certified study guides. Um, and so we have three of them available for our certification portfolio. Um, and as you can see, they map to the Associate Cloud Engineer, the Professional Cloud Architect, and the Professional Data Engineer. Um, what more, uh, these are great assets if you are someone that just likes to have something in front of you to study with or just want additional practice questions outside of the sample questions available on our website. And so if you visit www.wiley.com, uh, we actually offer a 50% discount um, and we will include that in all of the follow-up material. So no worries if you do not have a pen um, besides you, but we will send all of that out. Uh, and again, this is just an additional great resource uh, in your preparation journey for any of these three certifications. So I will hand it back to Alyssa so she can talk about all the fun stuff of why and the benefits of actually getting a Google Cloud certification. Thank you, Margo. So we're seeing across our certification program that there's numerous benefits. One, you're gonna feel more confident in your future. You're able to prove your skills to recruiters. And with that, your resume looks more attractive. You're able to add those badges to LinkedIn 
and you're feeling more confident in your cloud skills overall. And this is really important because confidence really goes into the job search and, you know, finding different roles or, you know, even just presenting yourself. And so it's really important to be able to harness these skills and have that as a part of your repertoire. Um, you also get some cool swag um, when you are certified. So once you receive a Google Cloud certification, um, you get a badge and a certificate. You get some exclusive swag, which is always awesome. Um, you also are a part of our Google Cloud certified community. And so you have that growing network where you're able to exchange those ideas and meet people. Um, and again, you're able to showcase those badges. So LinkedIn, other places, you know, social media, you can really show that off because you worked hard for that. As Margot talked about before, we have a great learning offer for you all. Um, our new platform, Google Cloud Skills Boost, um, is a destination where we host all of the labs, the courses, um, and all of the resources that we talked about today. Um, and so you will be able to access all of these resources for one month or 30 days at no cost if you visit the link cloud.google.com slash training slash learning dash path dash offer. Again, like Margot said, if you don't have a pen, we'll send everything out. Um, but this is a great offer that we have for you all. So please sign up and start taking advantage of that learning. We also have a couple of additional resources that we wanted to highlight, um, our tutorials, quick starts, cloud minute and sample projects. Um, these are great resources that you can look to, to be able to prepare, learn more about cloud um, and really get different perspectives um, on things within that stratosphere. And with that, we just wanna thank you for your time. We really enjoyed being able to have this time with you all. Um, if you have any questions, we know you have your live Q&A there uh, with the experts, so uh, we'll leave it to them. But thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks again, Margo and Alyssa. There's always so much to learn on Google Cloud Learning, and it's an incredible learning offer, so don't forget to take advantage of that. This is really incredible information about cloud careers and getting certifications. And if you have any more questions, feel free to add those questions to our IWD Slack channel or to the email address that you see on your screen, and we'll be glad to get those questions answered for you. And now if you all want to take a few minutes to get those questions together while we get ready to introduce our incredible next speaker, her name is Amber Booth McCoy. And Amber is a proud native of Little Rock, Arkansas. She received a dual bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology from the U of A Little Rock. Currently, Amber serves as a Senior Diversity Specialist and Manager of Intercultural Education for the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In 2018, Amber expanded her efforts towards affecting culture change by founding the Diversity Booth. The Diversity Booth is an innovative, inclusive, equity, and social justice consulting firm. TDB <laughs> is experienced in co-creating sustainable, measurable, and inclusive cultures. Their diverse client portfolio includes several prominent international and national organizations. Whether due to her eye-opening TEDx speech, Cause of Death, Kind, or Colorblind, delivered in the spring of 2020, or her DEI-centered written works founded in Forbes magazine and other well-known publications, Amber is considered an inclusive thought leader in her field. She enjoys traveling to deliver DEI-centered keynote addresses, motivational speeches, and guest lectures in an effort to disrupt and dismantle systems of oppression. Of all her many roles, Amber maintains mama and it's far from and is far the most rewarding and indescribable pay. She works zealously with the desire to see the world where everyone's sons and daughters are treated equitably. In the pursuit of happiness will never be impeded by hate or discrimination. So with that being said, I'm excited to hear what she's going to share with us today. With no further introduction, 
please welcome Ms. Amber Booth McCoy. There, am I off mute? <laughs> Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. I am super excited to be here. Um, it has been such an amazing just time just being able to be amongst such amazing women. So um, hopefully I get to add to that and we have a conversation and just talk about what social justice looks like and what that means, I guess, a little bit to me and hopefully to you as well. When we are the ones we've been waiting for. Um, it is often said that necessity is the mother of invention and innovation. And I know that dealing with women in tech, that I don't have to explain that at all. Um, I also firmly believe as a diversity specialist that it is also tragedy, despair, and injustice that's often the forebearers and mother of change, legislation, justice, and necessary and needed conversations designed to right past wrongs. As a diversity specialist and inclusion strategist, one of the questions that I'm asked most often, other than Amber, is it racist or sexist if? And the answer is always yes, always. But outside of that, it is, I talk to individuals who know that something is wrong, that society on a local, national, and international scale is not working at its best for everyone. And that the factors that should play no part in your quality of life, such as who, how, or what you were born, are impeding individuals' right to life, liberty, and that pursuit of happiness. And they're ready to be part of the change. They are ready to do something that says, how do we shake this up? And I am often reminded of the words of activist, author, and powerhouse June Jordan. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So often in the workforce and in society, we hear that representation matters. And representation most certainly matters. You can't be what you can't see. What's also true for many marginalized and historically excluded identities and populations is that individuals are blindly but boldly walking with vision and passion because they are the representation. More often than not, it is important for those of us who are the first to make sure that we are not the last and not the only. So I'll tell you, like I tell my friends and family, I don't know everything and I will always share what I know. And if I don't know, I will always be willing to grow with you. So first things first, as a lover of words, um, a, the daughter of a principal coming from a family of educators and now being a professor myself, one thing for sure that I know is that language is a labor of love and that words matter. So let's get on the same page first as it relates to just social justice. Social justice, according to Miriam and Webster, is the fair treatment of all people in society, including respect for the rights of minorities and equitable distribution, equitable distribution of resources among members of a community. To have conversations about justice and to do so fairly and with context means that we start by acknowledging that equity and equality are not the same. That we did not get the disparities that we have in healthcare and education in wealth and in criminal justice by giving equally and we won't fix them by giving equally. Equity is where we give what is needed to whom it is needed it is going to be inherently unfair. It's gonna look like preferential treatment, playing favorites, and programs designed specifically for identities and communities. And I'll tell you, it's damn fair. Until society works for the most vulnerable of us, then, well, it truly functions for none of us. The reason that we are the ones that we're waiting for is because power has now and always resided with the people. Separate, we are weak, but together we are mighty. 
A few months ago, I was working with an institution and the goal of this institution was to bring awareness to black maternal and infant mortality. Now, this is a vastly important subject because as a black woman, I am three to four times more likely to die from maternal related complications than my white counterparts. And when researchers exclude for every other variable, social economic status, geographic location, education, you name it, it still comes down to race. Now, as a part of this initiative with this institution, we were watching an amazingly done short film um, that follows the life of a pregnant black woman or the day, if you will, of a pregnant black woman. Um, and I'll, I'll just tell you that the, the film ends in, in tragedy. But after watching the film, we would have small group discussions with members of the institution. Now, <clears throat> I facilitated these conversations over and over again. And after watching the film, I often would ask participants to share the first word that comes or that bubbles up for them at the end of watching the video. And in one of the first conversations that we're having, there was a, a white female participant that shared that she was sad, honestly, but she was relieved. She was relieved that the baby passed away and not the mother. Now, understand that for me, I needed to pause a moment, honestly, because that is her truth. But the truth for me is that I saw myself in the lead character. I saw myself as that Black woman. So what I heard her say was that she had already reconciled my death from the beginning. That she had already come to terms with the tragedy of my demise. And when it didn't happen, she was relieved. Social justice means that each and every one of us has to get to a place where we don't become excited or relieved when tragedy doesn't happen, but that we fight tooth and nail to prevent tragedies and inequities and injustices from happening. That we are no longer pleasantly surprised when someone overcomes the odds, but that we are continuously distraught that those are the odds that one must overcome. Late civil rights activist and United States Representative John Lewis said that we have to get in the way, that we have to get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. Each and every one of us has to decide what trouble looks like for us. Understanding that Every single ballot cast is either a step forward or backward. That when we review candidates for our city boards, our school boards, our, our communities, that we do so not with just our family and our identities in mind, but with our whole community in mind. I have a group of friends and we have an organization because we are dope AF, it stands for amazing females. <laughs> and um, we often argue over influence versus power and which is more important. Now, I'll tell you that um, our friends and, and, and member of this coalition, Gianni, often reminds us that the power resides and rests with the people. And I wanna remind you that we individually decide as a collective, the type of influence that we will allow, that we embrace, that we amplify, and ultimately that we deserve as a community. Each and every one of us has a sphere of influence your group of friends, your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all five of your followers have decided to follow you. And that means that they're listening to you. 
2020 was a hard year for most all of us. It was difficult for be to endure a global pandemic and here in America to endure that pandemic amid so civil unrest and injustices, gross miscarriages of justice, such as Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the very public and long murder of George Floyd. I can tell you as a diversity specialist, I am used to having conversations about race and identity. But in 2020, my heart was broken so many times, not because of the hate and vitriol on my timeline. My heart was broken because of the silence from individuals that I wanted and needed to hear from. <coughs> the silence of my white 12th grade prom date broke my heart. I thought, even if he only knows me, can't he say something, something during all of this? And he said nothing. Holocaust survivor, Nobel Peace Prize recipient and Eli Whistle said, one of my favorite quotes that we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are in danger, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. Each and every one of us experiences center of the universe moments. Center of the universe moments are when you are in the boardroom, in break rooms, bedrooms, in dining rooms, and you hear someone say that bigoted, racist, sexist, discriminatory thing. That is your center of the universe moment. It's my job to say, Uncle Joe, that's not okay. I don't actually have an Uncle Joe. That's not okay. And Uncle Joe may never stop saying the things that he said, but somebody, somebody saw Amber take her center of the universe moment. And maybe that means that they'll take their center of the universe moment. And every single center of the universe moment taken is one step closer to a world that is equitable and just where individuals don't live in fear simply because of their identities. It's important for us to remember like this year's theme, progress, not perfection. In my field and in the work I do in my community, I often hear individuals who are saying that they want to say something, that they want to do something, that they want to be a part of change. The truth is they're afraid to get it wrong. I have to remind them that there are very few things that I did that were perfect the first time that I did them. I can't think of any, actually. It also means that we're going to get it wrong sometimes. Fighting for social justice means that you're going to keep showing up even when you don't know everything. I don't need every single fact on pedophilia to tell you that I am not okay with it, it is wrong, and we must protect children. Just that simple. I like to think of these conversations like the fast food restaurants that we go to. We go to fast food restaurants and they get your order wrong every time. You ask for ketchup and you get mustard. You ask for catch, you ask for napkins, you never get those. And guaranteed, there is one fast food restaurant that we don't even know why they still have an ice cream machine. And you know what we do? We show up the next day smiling, ready to let them get it wrong again. 
We have to continue showing up for uncomfortable conversations, scary situations where we are fighting to amplify the voices of the vulnerable, the unheard, and the oppressed. We hear lots of conversations about allyship. And the truth is, when it comes to allyship, what I think of is I think of war. When a country goes to war, the countries that they are allied with say, hey, I'm going to fight with you, alongside you. And what that means is that I could experience the same consequences that you experience. Being an ally means that you are ready to show up and fight injustice, that you are acknowledging that you are taking a side and that silence only encourages the tormentor. It's also true that I tell you that what comes from the heart reaches the heart. During 2020, when life was tough, and especially for me, just as a Black female diversity specialist and mother of two Black sons, 2020 was a tough year for me. And when George Floyd died, one of my white friends, she sent me flowers. Now, I teased her and I told her I had never received Black flowers before. But the truth is, I knew what she was saying was, I know that something is wrong. I don't know what to say but I need you to know that you're on my mind. Those flowers meant everything to me. She didn't call me to talk about the injustices of the world or how she was going to set right past wrongs. She simply gave me a gesture that let me know I'm thinking about you and your whole self, you and your identity. I'm not going to pretend that you are not a black woman that is being impacted by what's going on in society. And those flowers meant the world to me. The truth is we have to keep showing up. That if we want to see a world where we are dismantling systems of oppression, where we no longer see food insecurity and and shelter insecurity and racism and sexism and misogyny, and, and we want to make sure that this world is better than it was when we got here. That it means we have to keep getting in good trouble. It means that we're going to have to take sides. It means that you keep showing up even when it's uncomfortable. Truth of the matter is, you know, I normally don't go to the gym until my pants don't fit. Like now. Um, But it is that discomfort that lets me know that it's time for change. I encourage you to lean into the discomfort of uncomfortable conversations because you know what's truly uncomfortable? Oppression, discrimination, prejudice, and individuals experiencing them are willing to share their discomfort with you just a little if you're willing to be bold enough to take it on because that's what allyship looks like. We can't keep questioning Who's going to do something and why hasn't someone done anything? We are the ones we've been waiting for. Progress, not perfection. It means that we may not see the complete and total end of that dismantling. But what it does mean is that if the world is not a little bit better, our communities, our families, are not a little bit better than they were before we got here, then shame on us. And then it means that we repeat and do it over and over again. My name is Amber Nicole. I am your favorite diversity specialist. Would love for you to follow me on social media. This is all of my social media handles and I will make sure to put them um, in our chat as well. And I am always open for questions. Thank you, Amber. Wow, what a powerful presentation. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, I have so many great nuggets. I don't even know where to start. Um, But yeah, definitely the center of the universe moment. I think there's always times where we feel very uncomfortable about confronting someone and we're not always sure what to say. 
But again, like you said, with progress, not perfection, we start somewhere. And if we mess up, you know, we got something to learn from That's and it. we do better the next time. <laughs> Absolutely. So if are there any questions that we have for Amber? Amazing yeah. people. I did. I love that too. It's the first time I've heard that one. I've got to use that going forward. <laughs> you know, dope AF. Yes. That's a, that's a. Yes, Sherry. Every voice is powerful. Um, absolutely. I think one of the things that I've learned uh, in series trying to Serious trying to ask me a question. Um, but one of the things that I learned as well is that my voice, you know, my voice matters. I'm very, I'm very kind of uh, reserved. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it is very hard to speak up. But it, yeah, absolutely. Every voice is important. And we all have a sphere of influence. I mean, even if it's yeah. the person next to you, you say something. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I see. Let's see. Uh, Dan just says such a powerful presentation and he can't wait to share it. So thank you much. Thank you. Thank you much. Awesome. Well, thank you, Amber. And if there are any other questions, we also want to make sure that we follow Amber on our social media. And don't forget to ask any more questions in the Slack channel. If you have more additional questions or to the email address that we, um, that we have for IWD. Oh, oh, we have a question. Okay, all right, let's see. <laughs> What's the biggest initiative right now that you are oh, most looking forward to move the dial? So um, honestly, in my in the state of Arkansas, um, I formed a coalition with other organizations called AR Creed, and we have launched statewide racial equity conversations focused on education. Um, and so I think that that is some, like education is something that genuinely I think everyone can get a, like wrap their arms around and say that students and children should not receive different levels or quality of education based on their identity. So I am vastly looking at, at the outcome of what these conversations will, will bring. It is it is literally organizations that you wouldn't think um, working together, bringing people from what they call both sides of the aisle down mm -hmm. to sit down and do everything from have dinner to have conversations about our own background. So um, that's something that I'm excited to see what the what the outcome of that will be. I, what I know is that having the conversation is most important and pretending that it doesn't happen is why we keep having to have the conversation. Absolutely. That is that all of our questions for Amber? Yeah. Well, if there are any more, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, feel free to share those again in the Slack channel and we'll be able to answer those for you guys. Thank you again so much, Amber. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Guys, I, <laughs> that was such, she's such a great speaker. I'm so, I was so excited to hear her presentation today. And let's see, next we're going to have Lisa, who's going to join us. Thank Hi, Lisa. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. So she's going to introduce, going to take forward with track three and our rest of our lightning talks. Thank you so much. What a wonderful day it's been, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time to join us. Um, so today we have a wonderful uh, lightning talk for steering your career advancements. Um, this is brought to us by Hume Hamid. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're happy to have you today. Are, can you hear us? Um, yes, I can hear you. Are you able to share your screen? Can you hear me now? Can hear you. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. Yes, I can. Um, do you want me to share my slides or? Uh, that would be excellent. Thank Are we you. ready? Okay, let's do that.
Can you see my slides? No, we're not able to see your slides quite yet. Okay, they're coming up. Seems like they're processing. Um, in the meantime, um, thank you for inviting. And I've been listening to all the talks. It, they were really, really awesome, especially I really loved um, Amber's talk. Um, there is a lot that I've learned from her. So thank you for you know putting this amazing show together. And thank you so much for joining us. I, while it's loading up, do you want to do a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Absolutely, yes. I would love to uh, start with um, almost eight years ago. I was one of you know one of the attendees for Women Tech Makers, um, and that was a time when I was also looking for inspiration. I was also looking for direction where I wanted to go next, what I wanted to do. Um, so that's. That's where I started. And in these seven and eight years, I have gone through several career transitions myself, um, things that inspired me, things that I wanted to um, pursue, things that interest, you know, um, I had interest uh, in, in pursuing as, as, as my career. So, and also co founded a nonprofit uh, focused on Pakistani women in tech. So all of that and mentoring a lot of other women, um, especially early and mid-career, looking for Korean transitions, looking for different um, opportunities to advance. And that's that's what I brought in today. And that's why uh, I'm really passionate about uh, this particular topic that I'm going to be discussing. OK. All right. So looks like we can. Uh, so my name is Mohammed. I am a product manager uh, working at Cisco, and I'm also the co-founder for Pakistani Women in Computing. It's a, a global nonprofit uh, representing Pakistani women in tech and their allies. And today I'm really excited to be here to talking about how do you steer your career advancement? Just like I mentioned in my introduction, I'm really passionate about this topic because almost seven years ago, I was also kind of lost. I was looking for aspiration. I was looking for, you know, what my next role would be, what my path would be. And I was a software engineer at that time, also an expecting mother. And I found a really amazing community, uh, women tech makers that opened so many different avenues for me, for exposure, for learning, for growth. And in all those years through different, you know, trials and trying different things around growth and learning, Right now, I'm a product manager, which I really wanted to be. I'm also a founder for a global nonprofit, and I'm a community leader, and I mentor and coach um, women like yourself, um, or I would say candidates who are looking for career transitions. OK, now is a very exciting time for somebody to be working in tech. And why is that? COVID-19 has accelerated the digital transformation and innovation initiatives all across the world. Globally, we have seen a spike in new initiatives, a lot of investment going in technology right now. And according to the report, multiple reports that one I quote here by McKinsey, that we, in some cases we have even gone like 10 plus years already ahead in innovation and digital transformation. Now, what does that mean for your career? Right now, talent is a leverage. The companies that are making headways are those who are able to find the right talent to be able to you know, implement that digital transformation um, and innovation initiatives. So if you have any career aspiration to, be, to go beyond where you are right now, there are opportunities available both that requires breadth, you know, if you're coming from a different uh, background and you would like to um, work in technology or you have other exposures through which you can bring value to, to your technology job, that's really a good time to be to be doing that. And there is also equal demand for depth, means if you really like implementing technology, then there is a number of opportunities available in the market. Now is the time when companies are actually willing to pay more to get the right candidates. So from that point of view, market for talent is really hard. Let's talk about your next role. So we've there are three things a friend mentioned, and I really like what she mentioned, and I, I'm quoting her here. There are three things that are really, really important to find your next role. 
And that role may keep changing as you grow. So it's not like a hard set in stone role, but we're, you know, let's say what you're looking for next. Um, it's your experience, what you work, you know, what your job is, what you're doing at work right now. It's your education. Um, and the, the last thing which we do not pay a lot of attention to, but that's the exposure. Exposure and explain what that means, but that is something that is really, really in your hand, that how you can expose yourself to multiple different problems, multiple different avenues, and the learning and the growth that you're gaining from there, how you can really use that to land your next role. So it's not just about education or experience anymore. Let's add another E to this combination, which is exposure. Also, always remember your career is unique to you. And for example, uh, out of you know the different mentees that I have mentored over the years, let's take example of Lisa. Now, Lisa's career advancement may mean that she has taken a break to take care of her family and now she wants to get back to work. So this is her definition of career advancement or growth. However, for Siri, it may be a different. It could be that she's already working in tech or she wants to uh, she wants to change to a different job family within tech, and that's a different kind of advancement. Now, there are other variations if you're coming outside of tech, there's there's that. Or if you're looking for, you know, advancing your career as a, as a leader or um, vertical, then that's a different kind of growth. But again, it's very unique to you. And always remember that nobody else can give you the recipe of what you need to do. We can only present different options that, and it's up to you which one you choose and what applies to you. All right. So take your career advancement as a building block. I love Legos because you can always put them together to create whatever you, you know, wherever your imagination goes. At the very bottom, you will see that there is your education and your experience. But again, that's not the only thing that can enable you, your growth and your advancement. You can always expose yourself to what's happening in the industry, doing some volunteer work, taking stretch assignments, expanding yourself, you know, through consultancy work or freelancing work. Um, education is also not limited to what you have learned at school. There's so many training and certification, online courses, online communities like Women Tech Makers available that can expose you to a very different uh, kind of learning. So that's another building block. Now, once you are doing that, there comes the networking, coaching, sponsorship, and the right network that can enable, expose you to, you know, what kind of opportunities are available, just like you're doing right now. And last but not least, you really need to be knowing or having really good understanding what you're looking for. So all of this combined can give you the opportunity alignment that kind of sits at the top. However, this is a perfect picture that you know, that I have presented, but we'll talk about what it may look like in real. Now, when we have this kind of trajectory, there is always self-doubt, there is always um, thinking, you know, maybe I should ask or no, maybe it's the right thing to do or not, maybe it's it makes sense or not, maybe I should take this step or not. All of that combined will impact you. It's very normal. It's having that self-doubt, not asking because you're not sure what you're looking for. And sometimes we also seek permission as if our growth, somebody else need to validate that we need to grow. All of those will impact you, but just remember these are not normal part of your growth. And all you need to do is to listen to that voice, but still trust in your own ability. Also, as you go out of your basic education and experience, the rest of the career, it, it's more spiral and very structured. Um, there's no well-defined career paths. Uh, you can take inspiration what other people are doing, but as you grow, just remember it's unstructured. That's why you need to know your building blocks in order to get to the, your opportunity alignment. All right. There are four things that I would really like to highlight if you are facing, um, and this is my, and just to let you know, this is my, this is how it may look like. There's not a perfect a uh, picture that I presented before. You may be, you know, in different order, you're doing different things, but there are four things, remember, through accountability, through discipline, taking the ownership and confidence, you can always get to the 
get to the role that you're looking for. And it's an iterative process. Once you get to one milestone, you may get inspired by a different role, and then you want to grow further in that direction. So it's a, it's an ongoing learning process. And I have put these Legos in a, in a, it's, it's kind of a work in progress. So you always learning and growing, um, and, and there are always new inspirations. It's just like I've said, ownership. You own your career growth. Other people can definitely help you. They can guide you. They can coach you. They can provide sponsorship to you. Networks can expose you to different opportunities. But it's really you who need to know what you're looking for. And it's through discovery what you're doing right now. These are the ways that you can uh, you can find out you know, what you're looking for. But it's really you. You own your career. Nobody else. Sometimes we also fall into, you know, if I should do this or not, if this is right or not. And then we give a lot of, you know, uh, power to noises that are coming from outside and kind of losing that confidence internally. But always remember, you really need to build that strength internally before any noise from the outside can impact you. There will be people who may be giving ideas, suggestions, feedback, but know that it's it's your confidence that will take you forward. And feel free to leave the places that you have outgrown. Also, there is a very good way to build that confidence is to build your strength chart. If you know what your strength, building upon them, using them with confidently is, is one way of really showing up uh, strongly you know, um, in, in, your, in your journey. Discipline, okay. We have everything, we have motivation, we have um, a vision, but if you're not exercising that with in a structured way, then um, you may just be prolonging your desire to what you're looking for in your career. So dis discipline is one way of doing that is to creating a roadmap, you know, define what your North Star is, what you really want to be, set your priorities. Is it learning? Is it exposure? Is it experience? Is it reaching out to somebody? And Create that roadmap for yourself, what works for you. There's so many examples online available. Even LinkedIn has several different um, uh, talks about, you know, that how to build that roadmap. But it, it can be very unique to you depending upon what you're looking for and in which time frame you are willing, you know, uh, you would like to achieve all of that. And the last one is accountability. Only you can hold yourself accountable. Uh, only you know if you're making the progress that you are aspiring to make and how far you are and sometimes it can take a couple of years sometimes it can take months sometimes it can take weeks really depending what your combination of uh, you, those building blocks are um, where most of people you know the people that I mentor where the only those who consistently work towards their goals are the ones who finally see results there number of time we get just harder we we think this may not be working. So um, gauging your progress, looking, you know, going back, retrospecting, reflecting, it's all of that. It's really, really going to help you. And it's a long game. Career is a long game. Finding your opportunities that really, you know, uh, make you um, like what you're doing. Sometimes it can take up to years, a couple of years. All right, always remember that growth we, is very unique. We all grow um, very differently. So what career growth for somebody else or advancement for somebody else looks like may not be the same for you. So be kind to yourself and remember that what you are doing for yourself is the right thing to do. Others may have different paths. And with that, thank you so much. If there are any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to take those questions. And I hope this was helpful. Uh, my, my intention here is to give you a very high level structure. However, there is, um, given your situation and your uh, you know, career aspiration, this may look very different. Or you can take um, aspiration from here or information that applies to you. But again, again and again. You know, it, your career is very unique to you. It's your learning, it's your exposure, it's your education that will make the difference for you. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much for this this lightning talk. Um, now we'll bring up some questions from everyone. I really appreciate it. So 
Um, someone asked, we're all remote now. What are some of the tips you could give to network with people and find ourselves mentors to help us along the way? Really good question. Uh, and I know that we are, you know, it's right now everybody is remote. So it, it can be really, really hard to reimagine how to connect and how to find mentors. Um, but it's really not different if you think about that location is now our digital. If you think about location in digital, you know, in, in virtual proximity, then we are still connected to people. There are still people that you can reach out to as mentors. However, there is a structured way to approach it. One, if you are working in a company where people are, you know, they're willing to mentor or if there is any mentoring program that is out there, there is always that path. Uh, communities like Women Tech Makers, if you have met somebody who really inspired you and you think that they can help you um, answer questions, you can always reach out to you. However, about mentors, do remember that it's a it's kind of a bi-directional uh, relationship. You can always reach out to people on LinkedIn. They may or may not respond to you, but a mentor is somebody that who is invested in you they may have already some understanding of your strength and skill set. So it's best to still find mentors in your network, somebody who is doing a job that you really like to do or somebody who has said something uh, that, you know, clicks with you. Um, it's just like we are in remote, you know, working from home. Um, I would say it's just our, you know, if we if we let go of that barrier of location, uh, virtual world, you can still network with people and find mentors, but the means are going to be digital and the communication and collaboration is still going to be digital in, in nature. I hope that answered your question. That was, that's excellent advice. And I think that everyone talks about the different types of mentors there are, and you already addressed that, but also just also be a mentor to someone else because that you'll get a lot out of that as well. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I don't see any other questions, but I am sure you have some last minute advice that you could give us or anything else to um, share your final words. There's one thing that I would really like to share, and it's it's continuous learning and continuous growth. Um, it's we definitely look at mentors and sponsors and networks to help us to, you know, to give us that clarity. And it's it's really good. We, we all need it. Um, but let me let me reframe this whole concept of career advancement that it really starts with you. Um, and there is a phrase, you know, that when the student is ready, uh, the master will show up. So if you know what you're looking for, what your, you know, what, um, what your aspirations are and how much effort you have already put in, into your, um, your learning and growth and development, uh, trust me, you will start attracting mentors, you will start attracting the sponsors, and you will start attracting the network who will be invested in you. So it really starts with you. And once you start showing that, you know, that vibe and energy, uh, you will find, you know, that people will also find you. So that's my last advice. And I hope all of you have a wonderful rest of your, uh, you know, all the sessions and learning and growth together. Thank you so much for joining us today. What an excellent conversation. Thank you. Um, and next, we are going to continue talking a little bit more about career advancement and talk with Kimberly. Um, Kimberly Bueno Shonig is going to teach us about strategies for landing a job in tech. Um, and she has lots of, uh, lots of years of experience and expertise. And I hope that everyone can enjoy this. Kimberly, um, are you? Thank you Hi, so Lisa. much for joining. Thank you so, so much for having me. And thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I think we're ready to go uh, with this presentation. So I, I can go ahead and dive in if that's okay. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. And thank you so much for sticking through the end. I know there's been several tracks I've been popping in and all of it has been amazing. Amber was amazing. Puma, who just went, was amazing. I also peeped into Lexus's NFT um, session that she just had. So hopefully you're all enjoying. And of course, since we had a whole um, conversation about steering your career advancement. Today, we're going to give you some tactical and actionable items so that way you can 
land a job in tech. If you are someone who is interested in tech and maybe you just don't know how to do that, well, today, make sure you have your pencils or your notebooks ready or your digital uh, notebooks ready because we're going to talk about it. So here is the itinerary for what I'm going to quickly go over in the next, hopefully, 20 minutes. Um, I'm just going to kind of introduce myself, go over some data. We're going to talk about some foundational assets and then dive into job search strategies, interview prep, and then some resources you can access. So a little bit about me. I have over six years of coaching experience and also fintech experience. I've worked really closely with a lot of financial services and technical um, tech industry. Um, one, I, one thing I've also been doing for a lot of corporations um, are curating programs specific to learning and development. So a lot of employee a development manager and leadership development. So I've worked really closely with a lot of companies on making sure that you are able to um, grow grow in the company. Um, I've facilitated over 175 virtual and in-person programs related to career professional development. And the strategies I'm sharing today have been tested and tried not only by myself, because of course, just like Huma mentioned, continuous learning is a big thing, but also by my clients. So these are tried and tested, and I stand by them 100%. So what is your goal for this session? Um, your goal is to walk away with actionable steps to make your transition to tech and make sure you execute them. Um, let's go over some data on women in tech because obviously uh, Google has created this amazing, amazing day for us to talk about um, how to break into tech, empowering women who are in tech, sharing resources and tips to do that. But let's kind of go over the data. In 2019, there was about 30.8% of women who are actually represented the overall workforce in the tech industry. In 2022, women represent about 32.9% in the overall work, uh, workforce in the tech industry. And this, this data is actually taken by Deloitte. And I wanted to share this image um, to kind of showcase the growth that we've seen so far on uh, female representation. Now, basically, in short, over the past few years, we've seen a 6.9% growth of women representation. That's amazing. That's that's a pretty, uh, pretty great jump, right? Um, we've seen an 11.7% growth of women representation in technical roles in the industry. So if you're watching this and you're um, you know, interested in breaking into a technical role, that is, we're seeing a huge growth in that. So I encourage you to keep going for that. Um, we've seen a 19.5% growth of women representation in leadership roles in the tech industry. So, of course, we want to see more women in leadership in the tech industry, and we're seeing that happen. I wanted to just share this graphic also um, provided by Deloitte, so please feel free to just take a look at it. It breaks down the growth from 2019 and the predicted growth for 2020. So I want to just end with something that Deloitte has mentioned. They predict that the large global technology firms on average will reach nearly 33% overall female representation in their workforces in 2022, up slightly more than 2% po percentage points from 2019. So if you're thinking about it, I want you to know that you can definitely break into tech. How you do it is by highlighting your transferable skills and by being proactive in your job search. So let's first talk about foundational assets because those are probably the one of the most important things in your job search strategy. So I'm gonna quickly just talk about what are foundational assets. You might not have heard of this before. I just like to call it it. Ultimately, I like to break it down into four things, your resume, your cover letter, portfolio, and LinkedIn. So what does this mean? I'm going to talk about a resume in a little bit in the next couple slides, but I do want to talk about and highlight cover letters because oftentimes I get questions from tons of clients asking, should I write a cover letter? Is it required? My short answer is it's unless it's required, you don't necessarily have to submit a cover letter, but if you write a really strong cover letter, it can play to your benefit, right? It's supposed to highlight or showcase the additional experience that you want to share with a hiring manager or recruiter. The biggest thing I want to just caveat here is that you want to make sure your writing is pristine and solid. So just make sure that if you are thinking about writing a cover letter, just have several people take a look at it, make sure there's no grammatical errors, and make sure you're utilizing that asset as a way to really highlight 
why you are the correct or the best candidate for that role. Portfolio, right? A portfolio can mean a different a different thing for different people, depending upon what type of role you're trying to go into. If you're someone who's into UX design or design in general, and you're trying to break into tech, a portfolio can look like some of the examples of designs that you've created. A portfolio can also be a website that kind of showcases your coding experience or additional projects that you might have worked on. And lastly, LinkedIn. I know in another track, uh, someone was talking about how LinkedIn has helped them a lot, and I stand by this 100%. LinkedIn is a growing platform, and I highly recommend that if you do not have a LinkedIn profile, to make sure you go make one right now. It's completely free, um, and it will help you not only network, but also just show um, a different side of who you are and up your personal brand, because that is important in today's um, uh, job search strategy. So I'm gonna kind of dive in now into your resume. So what should you include in your resume? I'm just gonna kind of quickly break it down. Um, obviously you wanna have your first name and last name and your personal information such as your LinkedIn URL um, and your contact information. Some of the sections you want to include in your resume is a summary for those that are a little bit more experienced, which should just be you know one to two, three sentences, highlighting um, and giving you an, uh, giving a very high level overview. Obviously, you want to include your experiences, um, any license and education, and lastly, your skills. So these are just the basic sections of what a resume should have. And in the um, at the end of this slide, we will also share a resource sheet with you that will give you a template that you can definitely use. So common mistakes that I've seen, not only with resumes, but I know as a former recruiter, I've also seen are grammatical errors. So make sure you're having people proofread your resume. Make sure you're you're just reading over all of your bullet points because we want to make sure all those grammatical errors are taken off. Another mistake is applying with a generic resume. Oftentimes I see a lot of people just have one generic resume that doesn't necessarily dive into the specific details of what your skills and experience are. And they use that generic resume to apply to a bunch of different jobs. And that right now, with the type of job market we're in is not going to necessarily help move the needle in trying to land that job in tech, right? Um, another common mistake is multi-page resumes. I've seen resumes with 10 pages. And if you're someone who has less than five years experience, your resume should really only be one page. Um, formatting issues. There's a quote out there and a statistic that says it takes about six seconds for a recruiter to take a look at your resume and decide whether or not you're going to move forward. Um, as someone who's also looked at resumes and worked with hiring managers and recruiters on this, um, I will say that maybe it's about six seconds. It does make it a lot easier when your format is pristine and easy to read. If it's difficult to read and you don't have great formatting on your resume, that could be a sign of lack of attention to detail, a lack of really understanding how to make things a lot easier for the recruiter and hiring manager to uh, read your resume. It can cause confusion on understanding where your experience is on your resume. So just make sure that you're using the correct format. Small font, difficult to read font. Sometimes um, I see resumes with tiny, tiny font or, you know, um, really big font, which is not necessarily going to help you in your favor. So biggest resume tip that I want to share with you is curate each resume for each job. So what does this mean? Ultimately, I have some actionable steps for you on curating your resume is create a resume that only you will see that lists out all the jobs, all the experiences that you've had throughout your lifetime, right? I always recommend this to people because it just helps you get all your thoughts, all of the items that you have worked on, all the projects that you've worked on, on a single doc. And this is totally okay if it's multi-page, right? This is not what you're going to be sending out. But the reason why I like to have this as a strategy or an exercise for people is because it just kind of puts everything into perspective, right? And not only that, is that once you start making more robust bullet points under each experience, you can start using that as a foundational resume to pull from when, when you're trying to create a, a, a curated resume for a specific job. Now, when you have this resume, 
you want to make sure that you're reading the job description thoroughly, right? Like I mentioned before, you do not want to send a generic resume. You want to read the job description and really understand what skills and experiences do you have that's transferable to a job in tech or for this particular job, right? You want to make sure that you're being thoughtful and really intentional with the bullet points that you're trying to place in your resume. Now, when you are reviewing your resume, you want to make sure that everything that is being highlighted is either providing metrics, data, and you're asking yourself, is this bullet point relevant to the job description? Is this bullet point highlighting a transferable skill that I know will be useful for this job? Awesome. So hopefully that was super helpful. Now let's dive into job search strategies. And at any point in time, if you have any questions about it, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I am more than happy to answer any questions. All right, so for job search strategies, I like to kind of give an overview because we only have a little limited amount of time today, but I've kind of broken it down into these few things. We're gonna talk about search, curate, apply, research, and track. So you're probably thinking, Kimberly, what does that mean? Well. Let's first talk about a strategy tip that I have to share with you. When it comes to job search strategy, and of course, I want to acknowledge the great resignation that we've had, right? It's still going on. It's still very difficult for companies to hire talent because either people are starting businesses, maybe people are just deciding that they know that they either deserve to get paid more or want better benefits or just want a different type of work environment, um, i.e., virtual or hybrid work environments. So when it comes to the great resignation, right, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's easier to land a job. I still hope and encourage you to try to be as proactive in your job search as much as you can, right? It is important and imperative for you to try to be as proactive as you as you can. And I'll kind of dive a little bit deeper in what that means, because that will help you stand out as a candidate. Now, here are some actionable steps for your job search strategy. Um, as I mentioned before, I broke it down in a few points. Search, what does search mean for me, at least? Search, what I mean by it is be very specific in the positions you are applying for. And what I mean by this is if you're someone who's unsure about what type of position you're interested in, make sure you really ask yourself, am I interested in an admin position? Am I interested in a product manager position? Am I interested in HR? When you are able to kind of solidify what your goal is in your career, you're able to kind of make sure that your foundational assets are ready to go. When you're having interviews, you can clearly speak to what your goals are, both short term and long term. It will ultimately play to your benefit. Now, curate. Curate your resume and your cover letter for each position you are applying to. And I know this might take some time, but it's incredibly, it's an incredibly important step. Apply. Um, sometimes, honestly, what I've what I've seen with specific job postings, when you can apply to a job as soon as it's posting, the faster you apply to it, the more likely a recruiter and a hiring manager are going to be able to see your application, right? If a if a job posting is, has been up for about a week, you can expect that 100 other people have already applied to that job. So when you're trying to prepare yourself, prepare your foundational assets, you're actually doing yourself a favor of reducing the time of prep work to apply to a specific job. So just make sure that you're trying to apply as soon as possible when you see a role that you think you're a really good fit for. Research. Look for the hiring manager or recruiter on LinkedIn and be as proactive as possible. Now, again, if you don't have a LinkedIn, make sure you go ahead and create one. But there are tons of ways where you can do some research on LinkedIn to find the hiring manager. Oftentimes, we'll see hiring managers or recruiters post a specific job that they are recruiting for or sourcing for. And that's a really great opportunity for you to connect with a hiring manager or recruiter and introduce yourself and give kind of like a very high level overview about why you are the best candidate for the role. Lastly, track. Now, I personally am a believer in this. If you don't feel like this is something up your alley, you don't need to do it. But I personally believe that you should create a tracker for yourself that lists out each job that you are applying to 
along with columns that list out the potential hiring manager and recruiters for that job. And the reason why I like to just encourage this is that a not only are you able to see how many jobs you've applied to, but you're also able to see the status when you apply to it, when you've um, applied or reached out to the hiring manager or recruiter, and kind of just get a sense of what's working or what's not. Right? Um, there's always always opportunities for you to improve and make progress, right? Because of course, if you're someone who maybe hasn't been job searching for a while, that might be something you're kind of have to um, work up to again, right? And so with that being said, I don't see any questions. So I'm going to continue going. We're going to jump into interview prep, right? Because obviously, say for example, you're already on it. You've already had your foundational assets already done, pristine. Um, you did great on your job search strategy and you've already landed a few interviews right you're probably thinking okay what's next well of course you're going to go through some series of interviews and i will say tech companies vary in terms of how long the interview process can be i've seen very lengthy interview processes and i think um what huma mentioned is that a lot of companies are are actually investing in making sure they have the right candidate for the role right so make sure that before you actually interview for the job, you're researching the people that are interviewing you. And make sure also to read recent article articles about the company to show that you've done your research, right? It's one thing to ask the same question that everyone else is asking, but it's another to go a step further than that and know a little bit about the interviewers. Right. And I'll know a little bit more about the company's direction. Maybe you know what their future business goals are, or maybe you know a little bit about the team. The more you show that you've done research, the better it's going to play to your favor. All right. So here are some actionable steps for you to prep for your interview. Build a pitch. Right. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's ultimately how I like to kind of just describe how to answer tell me about yourself. I do a lot of mock interviews with a lot of people just to help them prepare and feel kind of um, what it means to get interviewed by someone when, when they ask you, tell me about yourself. So knowing how to pitch yourself, sell yourself, know how to answer that question is going to really help you. The first few seconds when you talk to a hiring manager or recruiter can really help navigate and lead how that conversation is going to go. Understand the STAR method. It's a great way to know how to answer behavioral questions. And in the resource sheet, I have linked some videos and some descriptions on what the STAR method is. Record yourself and watch it back. Something that I really do think um, that will help you in your interview process is speaking confidently, right? It can be nerve wracking when you're you know, very excited for this job, but you haven't interviewed for a while. So one of the best things you can do is practice not only with family and friends, but to record yourself and see where you can slow down, see where you can pause, see where you can kind of tighten up or say things more succinctly. And one of my favorite tips is to hop on 15 minutes before your actual interview to double check your tech. Uh, to be completely honest, I actually, before I hopped on and presented, I hopped on an hour, 30 minutes before I was actually supposed to present because I was that paranoid about my technical issues. And this might not seem like a big deal, but say, for example, your tech problems all of a sudden come up during your interview, right? That can just be a lot of time potentially that you would have lost if you just had prepped 15 minutes beforehand or even 30 minutes beforehand. And lastly, practice, practice, practice. I can't stress that enough. Um, the more you practice speaking to other people, the better you will be at it. Awesome. And I know we're almost out of time, so I wanted to allow, allocate some time for questions, but I just wanted to quickly talk about some resources for your transition to tech, because I know that with these actionable steps, you can definitely land that job. Whether you're in a technical role or a non-tech role, I guarantee you that with your proactiveness and being able to really strengthen your skill set, a skill set you can definitely land um, and transition to tech. Now, some of the things I'm a really huge advocate for is finding opportunities to upskill yourself, right? Or to level up your experience. And one thing that Google offers are certificates through Coursera. Um, I have personally done the project management certificate. And I think that they 
They've done a really great job. You can find it on Grow with Google. Um, some things you get actually when you go through the certificate um, or you go through the course and receive your certificate is you get access to a bunch of career resources. You get access to everyone else who um, who were also taking that course. Um, and it could be an opportunity for you to get your foot in the door, right? There's also great LinkedIn learning courses and also the resource sheet that I'll be sharing with you um, at the end of this deck, but also I think everyone, um, I think the, I think Google will be sharing it with you after. Awesome. I believe that is it. I, I hope, I hope this is enough time for q and I just wanted to see if we had enough time for Q&A. We do have time and we, we love to have some questions, but if it's okay, I'd like to start with one. Oh um, yeah, of course. I was, I was keeping an eye on the chat and somebody brought up having that easy click button for applications um, such as Indeed and LinkedIn. Can you kind of give everybody the short of what your thoughts are on that and the advantages or disadvantages? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. And my personal opinion is to not only apply through LinkedIn, if it says an easy apply, but also apply through the website. It doesn't hurt to have your application go in twice. If anything, it's just uh, another way for the recruiter or hiring manager to see your name in the ATS. Um, so I personally think it's great to just do both just in case, just because um, the way that I've worked with the LinkedIn recruiting tool is that oftentimes, you know, we, we reference first the, the, the company website to see if any applications come through and then we will check LinkedIn. Um, so I personally recommend doing both. And great advice. And I will say um, with Indeed Easy Apply, the formatting is not very friendly. So if you can avoid the Indeed Easy Apply, I, I highly recommend avoiding it if possible. Do you agree, Kimberly? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I actually am not familiar with Indeed's Easy Apply. So um, I, I personally, anything off of Indeed, I would just apply directly. Mm -hmm. um, with LinkedIn, it's a little bit nicer because they do actually have you upload your resume. But um, I still think that it's always good to just uh, apply directly too. I agree. Thank you so much. Um, so someone asked, how do you stand out from the tech talent competition right now? That's a great loaded question. And I personally think, A, being proactive, um, B, finding opportunities to work on projects. It depends on what type of role you're interested in. I think for, for those that are interested in technical roles, specifically engineering roles, I think it's a great opportunity for you to kind of work on projects outside of your current role or outside of what you're currently doing to really showcase those engineering skills, right? Um, another thing you can do is take courses like on Grow with Google or through LinkedIn. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest ways to stand out. Thank you. That was a great question. Can you share um, after this, I imagine, a few screenshots of a well-formatted resume so people can see? Yeah, of course. Um, in the resource sheet, I've also attached a resume template, but I will make sure to um, provide some screenshots as well. Is there anything that you would say means well-formatted to you? Sure. I mean, the, the biggest thing that first comes to mind is um, sometimes I've seen people put their photo on the resume. That's definitely not a standard format. I think ideally, when I think of formatting, I think of um, consistency throughout the resume. So are it, when you're putting the job title and the dates across from it and the company un underneath it and the dates of employment, are those consistent throughout the entire resume? Are the margins consistent? Are the bullet points consistent? Sometimes I see people put one bullet point, but then five on another experience. And just knowing that, uh, you know, that to me, that would come off as a formatting issue and then potentially also a content issue as well. So just so, some of those are the top top things that come to mind. Great. Um, some companies have automated filters to strip through the styling. How do you stand out from the tech talent Oh, I guess um, they're asking with the automated filters, how do you um, stand out if you can't really format your your resume when you're applying? Yeah, I think um, by automated filters to strip the styling, are they talking about a, a Google Doc maybe? Let's see. Um, I think that, so as I understand it, so um, some very large companies 
ultimately are just going to strip out some of the information and provide over almost like a bio instead of the actual resume. Uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, I, so I, I know with some of the companies that I've, so for example, I helped with, um, I've looked at and reviewed some of the resumes from at two Sigma while I was there. And I could tell you right now that, um, what will help a lot is if you're able to have a strong LinkedIn profile. One of the first things that a recruiter or hiring manager does is look at your LinkedIn profile. Um, and also on top of that is just making sure that if you are someone who has a, co a couple years of experience, having a strong summary at the top. I know that recruiting agencies do this a lot is that they'll kind of have a small bio at the top of your resume when they send it over to the company. So that's another way you can stand out um, just because it's giving a high level overview of, you know, who you are. And lastly, I think that this is where the proactiveness needs to come into play. When you're reaching directly out to hiring managers or recruiters and, and starting that conversation, then then there, there's already that conversation there that will allow for you to determine whether or not you're going to move forward or whether or not you're a good fit. So those are just some, some strategies that come to mind. Thank you so much. Any other questions out there from the audience? What are your thoughts on being connected to, to LinkedIn to your parents? Is this seen as inappropriate? That's a very interesting question. I, I would say it's probably not considered inappropriate. I I I don't think it's LinkedIn comes off as almost like Facebook, uh, where you know it's very social. I think when you're when you have a LinkedIn profile, it's actually not as easy to 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 see your network, right? You kind of have to know who to look for, click on that specific page and then go through it. So I think it's totally fine for you to connect with your parents. Um, I don't think that's inappropriate at all. Thanks, Kimberly. But I would know we don't want your parents to leave reviews for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Kimberly, um, I think that we're out of, like we're going to wrap up the questions, but any last thoughts, anything you want to wrap with? Um, I think I just want to end with saying thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to support you in your journey into landing a job in tech. Wonderful. And do you prefer people reach out to you on LinkedIn? Yeah, that works. That, that's perfect. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was really fun. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. All right. That's a wrap, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today. And huge thanks to all our amazing speakers and Nikia and Lisa for helping hosting this track with me today. And uh, of course, all our IWG North America steering committee team members who are in the background. Um, this event would not be possible without their support and their contributions. So huge kudos to all of you. And kicking off day one of IWG North America today. Feel free to continue sharing your feedback with us. The link is provided um, in the Slack group and also we'll share it on the screen here for a chance to win some awesome ref prizes. As we did mention, we have some Google Cloud credits, some Google Swag bundles, and many other things. So feel free to um, share your feedback here via this link. And also continue con your conversations in the Slack group. Um, the Slack will still be open um, today and the rest of tomorrow as well. So you can continue to uh, mingle with the rest of the attendees. And also we have the speakers also jumping in and out of those as well. And until then, I guess we'll see you tomorrow. Have a great rest of your afternoon, evenings, and we'll see you back for day two. Take care, everyone. <laughs>